Welcome to the final Dornsife Dialogue of 2022. I'd like to wish everyone in our extended Dornsife community a terrific holiday season filled with good times, good friends, and good health. And speaking of health, we are ending the season with a dialogue on germs. From their ability to make us just sick enough to keep our kids home from school, to toppling entire civilizations, these tiny microbes have a well-deserved reputation for wreaking havoc. But we can also be too quick to cast them as villains. Many germs actually protect our bodies or maintain balance in our ecosystems. Unsettling as it may be, we can't live without them. Today, our USC Dornsife experts will explore our complex relationship with microorganisms, and we'll talk about some of the many beneficial things that germs do for us and our world. The conversation will be led by Susan Forsberg, Distinguished Professor of Biological Sciences at USC Dornsife. Professor Forsberg studies cell division in yeast DNA to better understand how cancer works in humans. Professor Forsberg is an elected fellow of the American Association for the Advancement of Science, the Association for Women in Science, the California Academy of Sciences, and the American Academy of Microbiology. Before I turn the program over to Professor Forsberg to introduce our guests, I'd like to thank you all across our extended community for tuning in this past year. I hope you'll continue to join us when we resume our programming in 2023. Meanwhile, enjoy the program and Happy New Year. Hello, welcome, and thank you, Dean Miller. When we met to discuss this dialogue, we agreed that germs is not a very scientific term. It applies pathogenic organisms. If you think about germs, you think about something that can infect you. So we're going to use the more neutral term microbe instead. This is a very general term that encompasses a wide range of single-celled organisms, including familiar eukaryotic cells like yeast, which is my own system of specialty, as well as protists, archaea, and true bacteria. Microbial systems have been used to model, as models to investigate fundamental biological processes, such as the mechanisms of DNA replication and cell division, as well as many aspects of human biology. Microbes can be human pathogens, of course, but are also essential co-residents in our bodies. If you've heard of the microbiome, uh, you'll know that you're inhabited by millions of microbes. But today, we're going to step away from the human-centered microbial science and discuss some of the amazing ways that microbes influence our physical environment and provide unique tools and opportunities. We're going to rename the session The Marvelous Microbes, or maybe The Beneficial Bacteria. Our distinguished panelists are Jan Amund, USC Dornsife's Divisional Dean for Life Sciences, Professor of Earth Sciences and Biological Sciences. Professor Ammon's work broadly encompasses geochemistry, geobiology, and astrobiology. Also, Mo El Nagar, USC Dornsife's Divisional Dean for the Physical Sciences and Mathematics, and the Dean's Professor of Physics and Astronomy. Professor El Nagar's research focuses on biological physics, biological electron transfer, bioabiotic interface, and living electronics. I'm going to start with Jan and ask him uh, to describe a little more about his work and how does a microbiologist end up in a department of earth sciences? Jan? All right. Well, thanks, Susan. Uh, thanks for the introduction. Very happy to be here. And uh, yes, I think it is um, interesting to think about how people end up in microbiology departments or end up as doing studying microbiology, even if this wasn't their, their, their background to start with. A lot of earth scientists, probably most earth scientists, uh, think about deep time uh, much more so than, than, than other people do. And deep time, what we're talking about here is the, you know, the four and a half billion years or so of Earth history. And if I can go to my first slide, thanks, is you know, this, this shows here um, in, the, in the Earth's biogeologic clock, um, the age of the Earth around four and a half billion years ago um, that, that Earth formed. And for most of that time, there has been life on this planet probably emerged on Earth around three and a half to four billion years ago. Uh, it's important to remember, uh, we don't know how life evolved or emerged. Uh, we don't know where it emerged. Um, we don't know exactly when, but we do know that it has been around for most of Earth history. But it's also important to, to recognize that that earliest life form definitely was microbial, um, you know, little bags of, 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 of water with stuff dissolved in it. Um, but that earliest life probably relied on chemical energy, not light energy. So the earliest life forms used chemical energy, 
perhaps around three and a half billion years ago, life figured out a way to harness the power of the sun um, and became photosynthetic. Not only photosynthetic, but in addition to using chemistry. When you think of photosynthesis, you probably think about um, oxygen production in our atmosphere, um, what plants and lots of cyanobacteria do. But the earliest photosynthesizers probably did not produce oxygen, um, did a different form of photosynthesis. Then maybe around two and a half billion years ago, um, oxygen producing photosynthesis emerged. And only then did oxygen start building up in the atmosphere and larger life forms um, start coming um, into, into being. Um, and then as you go around sort of the, that, that um, Earth's biogeologic clock, then you start getting into more complex organisms, algal ecosystems, um, vascular plants. And only in the last few you know, minutes to seconds, if you think of the, the entire history as a 24 hour day, do we start coming up with mammals and ultimately with, with humans. So the point of the slide really is to say life has been on this planet for most of its history, four and a half million years, life on it for most of that time. And for the vast majority of that time, it was only microbial. And if we go to the next slide, uh, it's a different way of thinking about this. This is what's known as a phylogenetic tree. It's basically how all of life is related to, to other organisms. Now, when I was in school, we learned about the five kingdoms. Maybe some of you learned about five kingdoms. The way we now think of life is in three groups, known domains here in green, red, and blue. Um, and really a couple of points to take away from this. The first one is, if you can sort of see there on the, in the very um, edge of the, the, the blue part of the tree labeled eukarya, you see something called visible life. Those three tiny little twigs uh, on the whole tree of life is where all the visible life sits. In other words, all of the bacteria, all of the archaea, and most of the eukaryotes are also microbial. Only a few twigs on the eukaryote um, um, branch um, is where visible life sits, the plants, the animals, the fungi. The other point I want to raise here, and this is sort of, it has to do with my research interests, is if you sort of see that amoeboid shaped black thing there in the middle surrounding um, what's labeled the root, you can think of that as the origin of life, the, you know, the earliest organisms, that many of the organisms that are closest to that origin um, are labeled as hot life. This gives us a sense that perhaps life originated in a high temperature environment, very different from most of the environments that we think about today. Um, so this gives you a sense of the incredible diversity of microbial life. And again, that Earth really is a microbial planet. And the last slide is just a bunch of pretty pictures um, of extreme environments where we know life to exist, or two examples here, and I'll let you figure out which ones they are, where we think maybe there is life, but we don't know that yet. If you start in the top left, this is a, what's a, a shallow submarine hydrothermal vent, maybe 10 meters, 30 feet of water depth in Papua New Guinea. You see hot water shooting out of the subsurface, and those orangish films are on the rocks around it are laden with arsenic, 7% arsenic in those mineral precipitates. And they're organisms actually getting energy from eating forms of arsenic and producing a different form of arsenic. So arsenic as an energy source. Uh, in the middle of the top there, that's a hot spring in Yellowstone. Um, in the middle, it's boiling. There's no life in the boiling temperature. But as soon as you get to the edge of the pool and the outflow channels, it starts cooling off and you start seeing thermophilic or heat-loving microbial life, including photosynthetic life that is heat loving as you get into the outflow channels. Top right is a picture of my graduate student, Heidi Aronson, working in a cave in Italy, collecting what are lovely um, term called snotites. So these are little drips off the cave walls, um, but she has measured the pH of these snotites, um, determined how acidic they are, and the acidity of these snot heights is down to a level of zero. So if you remember using pH paper in your, in your chemistry labs, you remember that you know, the acid side of things is down there in the zero, one, two range, and these snot heights are at a pH um, close to zero. Bottom left is a picture from Antarctica, the coldest place on earth. Um, and there are life forms um, that are living in very, very cold temperatures. In the very background, you might see a little bit of a red splooge there on the glacier. This is a place known as Blood Falls. Um, it's basically metal, uh, sorry, ferric iron coming out. Uh, so the organisms doing iron microbiology um, or iron um, chemistry um, in Antarctica. Bottom right is a deep sea hydrothermal system 
bottom of the ocean, several thousand meters of water depth, the water coming out at many hundreds of degrees Celsius, perhaps not like there in those fluids, but very close to them, you have organisms tapping into that geochemical energy source. The two pictures I have not talked about yet um, are places that are extraterrestrial. So we have the, um, a, a, an image from NASA um, for an upcoming mission um, with a dragonfly mission to go see the moon Titan um, on the planet Saturn. Um, we think you know there's possibility of habitability, so that maybe life can exist there. And the, and the bottom in the middle, that's the moon Europa, um, one of the satellites for Jupiter. These are two planetary bodies that are known as ocean worlds, places where we know there's liquid water at or near the surface. And for various reasons, we think they might be habitable to microorganisms. Um, so these are just some examples of the extreme environments where we know life can exist or where we think life may be able to exist. And it's just sort of painting a picture of how long life has been on this planet, how diverse microbial life is, and the incredible number of, or uh, the variety of ecosystems that life, uh, microbial life, not only can tolerate, but can thrive in. And that, I'll turn it over to, to Mo. All right, thank you, Susan, and thank you, Jan, uh, for that introduction. As I was thinking of the, sort of Jan reflecting on how he as a professor of earth sciences works and in microbiology and looks at microbes in all these interesting locations, it also occurred to me that I had, a, I, I had an unusual entry into this field. I had a training in a very sort of basic uh, applied physics and engineering context until I one day attended a public forum, not unlike the one that we're doing now, although this one is virtual, until one day I attended the public forum with somebody presenting on all the amazing things that microbes can do. And then I was hooked and I got into doing what I do now. So I want to give you, um, Jan gave us this kind of amazing view of how microbes make up the unseen majority, if you will, of our planet and how they seem to be able to survive in every possible environment, like all these pictures that he showed, every environment that you can think of. And one of the key things that I want to highlight, which drives the interest, my own research interests, is that being able to live in all these environments has given these microbes wild abilities that open the door to all sorts of new technologies that otherwise seem impossible if you look at other life forms, including our human cells. So I want to walk you through basically just one example. Uh, it has to do with how we make energy, how our human cells make energy, versus a particular group of bacteria that's called electric or electroactive bacteria, which actually have their origin in some of this iron chemistry that Jan was, was telling you about. And also kind of walk you through how that led to all sorts of new innovations. So I'm starting here with this very high level illustration of how you and I make energy, how our human cells make energy. So inside every single one of our cells is this beautiful machine called the mitochondrion, right? And you may have heard about it before. People call it sometimes the powerhouse of our cells. Its job is to make energy. It really is the thing that powers our, our, our human cells, our bodies. So you give it some ingredients, you know, you give it some of those ingredients on the left, you give it some sugar, some carbon source, you give it some oxygen, and essentially you get out things that are familiar, you convert to CO2, you reduce oxygen to water, and you also get some energy out of this. And the thing that I want to highlight is that this is basically an electric machine. The way it works, all life is electric in some form or another. And the way this works is that it's stripping electrons. That's essentially an energy currency that life uses. It's stripping electrons from some food source and giving it to oxygen. And that's how our human cells work. Um, I want to now contrast it with this next picture, with this next slide of this form of bacteria called iron reducing bacteria. What you're looking at is, uh, so the yellow kind of uh, rod looking things there, the cells, each one of them is about a hundredth of the width of your human hair, if you will. And this reddish surface that they're living on is actually a rock. It's a mineral that has some iron in it. And what these cells are doing is something similar to what I just described to you that our own mitochondria do, except instead of performing that electric miracle on oxygen, they're doing it to this external rock, right? So this is why we call them electric bacteria. They figured out a way of, of coupling their own metabolism, the way they make energy, to being able to interact with an external abiotic surface. It's in a nutshell, sort of like a reduction of everything that has to, everything that describes to you how 
how the biosphere, right, represented here by one particular bacterium, interacts with the geosphere. Um, here's one rock, for instance. So I got very interested in the system years ago uh, when we realized that we could have those bacteria do what they do in the environment, but instead in our own physics and chemistry labs, we could have them interact with physical electrodes that then we can use for all sorts of applications. So if we go on to the next slide, I wanna show you a movie here. The little white blobs that you see here are individual cells. And what you're watching is the growth of these cells on a surface. There's no minerals anymore. There's no iron. We've taken them outside of their natural environmental context. But these two leads there that look like the leads of a battery that are sitting on the surface, the T-shaped the uh, shapes that are, that are running from the right and the left, are physical electrodes. So what we've done is taken their ability to interact with the mineral, taken away the mineral, and then told them, what if we were to just set this electrode this chip that we make in the lab in a clean room, what if we set it at a voltage similar to what this microbe would encounter in the environment? Would they be able to interact with it? And yes, they're able to. So you can see kind of the white blobs increase in numbers over the span of a day and a half or so, which is the time scale of this movie. It's the closest thing to sort of a cyborg metabolism that you can possibly imagine. Right, So it's a cell that some of the metabolism is happening inside the cell using chemistry that we understand, but some of it is happening outside the cell, interacting with these physical leads that we draw on surfaces. This gives us unprecedented power to be able to do measurements with great detail and try to understand how this very early form of respiration works. But what we're also excited about is to see kind of the journey where you can develop all sorts of applications that come from this unusual ability. So I now want to show you a picture um, here in the next slide. On the left is a schematic that looks like a battery. It's recognizably a battery. It has two leads in it, you know, a positive and a negative. And it really is a battery. But what it's illustrating to you is that instead of using some expensive metal, for example, to drive the, the some chemical reaction that then produces electricity. Instead, inside this battery, you would have a living, breathing organism. And these electrons that these cells produce as a, natu as, as a natural part of the respiration are now harvested as an electrode to make energy. So you give the bacteria food and out comes electricity. The left is a schematic. The right is an actual microbial battery or microbial fuel cell that was built here at USC in a collaboration with, you know, with multiple folks in the physics, chemistry, and biological sciences departments that you can actually use to produce power for some useful purposes. Another example, once you can tap into cells this way, so if I show you the next picture here, it turns out that you can develop technologies where instead of giving them specific food, you give these bacteria waste, right? So waste is rich in organics. It's a form of food, of course. And what happens is the bacteria simultaneously eat up these organics, so cleaning up this waste, and produce a little bit of electricity. So instead of using power, instead of using electricity from the grid to treat wastewater, we're using this natural metabolism that, this, that these cells have had for probably billions of years, and we're putting them inside a battery, feeding them dirty water. That is the top left picture there that came, actual sludge that came from a wastewater treatment plant, and out comes this cleaned up water on the right side. And at the bottom is an actual picture of one of these reactors. This, this company here that is referenced in the slide is actually founded by a former PhD student at USC using this technology that was based on an organism that was discovered by USC faculty members. It's kind of a USC story, faculty member discovering the organism, and 30 years later, you have companies that are using it for wastewater treatment. And in the last picture, walking you through some of the more kind of futuristic things that we've been working on with this particular type of metabolism, we've started asking questions of whether it is possible to take organisms like this and not only use them for, you know, producing energy or making fuels or converting waste to electricity, but whether we can use this unusual bioelectronic phenomena that cells have discovered to build actual functioning electronics that we call living electronics. So what we're after is the best of both worlds. Our traditional electronics that are based on silicon and various other semiconductors are very good at certain things. But biology is also very, very good at a lot of other things, sensing, computing, processing information, responding, moving. 
And we're trying to do is create this hybrid electronics that have living, breathing organisms in them. And on the right is kind of a visual illustration of this, although it's a real picture of um, a circuit that is basically drawn using these living organisms. So you'd be looking, you know, some of us have looked at colonies on a Petri dish. Now, exam now imagine being able to print colonies that are electronic, that have interesting electronic behaviors in a Petri dish on a surface, and then using it for, for, some, for some interesting applications that maybe our traditional electronics can't do. So what I, what I wanted to give you is just one taste for how a solution that life seems to have invented many millions of years ago to live on rocks with some basic science basically has led to innovations in energy sustainability and even futuristic bioelectronics. So far, far away from what we think about when we think of germs and, and pathogens. That's great, Mo. Um, thank you for that. Uh, I think it's really fascinating that studying some of this basic chemistry can lead to these um, uh, potential applications uh, that uh, could be solutions to particular environmental problems. And um, I know Jan touched briefly on some of the uh, other sorts of chemistry of some of the bugs he talked about. Bugs is slang for bacteria. Um, and so Jan, I wondered if you had uh, any uh, similar sort of examples of applications that are deriving from some of the organisms that you've uh, identified. Yeah, um, thanks. Um, it's you know, it just always um, boggles my mind is when I think about the incredible um, diversity um, in the microbial world. Um, and I try to sort of touch on you know, the, the, the time period that life has been on earth and also the, the incredible um, diversity of um, you know, uh, the phylogenetic diversity, how, how, how broad that is, but also the incredible um, chemical diversity, the different kinds of metabolisms that microorganisms can do. Um, uh, Mo hinted at this, you know, with an organism sitting on, a, on an iron um, bearing mineral, for example, instead of using um, oxygen, but using the form of iron as, as, as the oxidant or as the electron acceptor. Um, just to sort of throw this out there, I mentioned arsenic. There are organisms that are able to take a form of arsenic um, and convert it to a different, less mobile form of arsenic. So you can imagine um, treating um, a water that is rich in um, the, sort of the dissolved form of arsenic, organisms coming in and precipitating arsenic and thereby removing it from the water. There are organisms that are using other uh, metals and metalloids um, either oxidizing or reducing them. Um, you know, you go down the periodic table and there are very few elements that the microbes have not figured out a way to, to tap into. Certainly, sort of some of the big elements um, that we think about is, is biogeochemists, carbon, the carbon cycle, just about every possible organism, uh, compound that, 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 we can, that we can think of, um, there's a microbial organism that can either produce it or consume it. Uh, the nitrogen cycle is incredibly complex. The sulfur cycle, um, sulfur comes in, of course, a lot in um, souring of oil, for example, or attacking uh, of pipes. There are organisms that will oxidize sulfur, they reduce sulfur. So it's just incredible amount of metabolic diversity. Um, and one area that, that I've been sort of starting to think a lot about is um, greenhouse gases. Um, so, um, you know, water vapor, of course, is a major greenhouse gas, but if we ignore water um, for now, um, really the three that we talk about most of the time is carbon dioxide, methane, CH4, and nitrous oxide, N2O. Um, and organisms consuming carbon dioxide is, is not a big surprise, but there are microorganisms that are really, really good at taking methane um, as a reactant and producing something far less harmful, in this example, carbon dioxide, for example, as a waste product, um, or taking nitrous oxide, uh, another major greenhouse gas, as a food source, as, an, as a reactant, and removing it um, and producing less um, noxious, if you'll, less, less problematic products like N2, um, which makes up most of our atmosphere. Um, so I'm happy to, to, to talk more about this idea of microbes and greenhouse gases, but that's just sort of one, one idea that microbes can be used perhaps to mitigate um, some of the, the biggest um, threats to, to climate change, and that is the greenhouse gases. What, what, what I find amazing about kind of the list of chemistries here that Jan went through First, it's a reminder of how basically microbes are, if you will, much better chemists than we are. They've had billions of years to figure out how to interact with essentially every element that's that's been on Earth. But what also strikes me is that for every single one of these examples, 
I can name either traditional applications or existing and future applications that are based on these specific chemistries. When you think of how microbes uh, are able to process nitrogen, for example, for nitrogen fixation, well, that is the basis of, of processes for making fertilizers that otherwise are very, very difficult chemistries to do in the lab. When you think of how microbes interact with arsenic, I mean, my own lab has looked at some um, arsenic reducing bacteria in order to actually make semiconductors. So you give the microbes forms of arsenic that they can respire, oxidize or reduce. And in the end, we ended up precipitating that as actual nanostructures that we built. We even built field effect transistors. We built functional devices out of nanomaterials, arsenic based that are made by bacteria while simultaneously removing that arsenic as waste from like that toxic arsenic as waste from water. So I mean, for every one of these applications, it just opens up a whole new book on on using bacteria that are good at certain functions and then developing new technologies that are based on that. I think it seems clear that uh, we probably, there's still a lot out there to be found. I mean, as, as Jan pointed out, there's a lot of exploration in trying to identify things. But um, if, you're, if you're dealing with some of these extremophiles, you know, the ones that like really hot uh, temperatures, the ones that like sulfur vents and so on, um, just practically, how do you identify those and grow them in a laboratory when they come from such an extreme or unusual environment? Because you can't just put them on a Petri plate like you would with a uh, E. coli. Right. Um, so uh, people started really thinking about uh, life in high temperatures um, when they were looking at hot springs and they started noticing the colors of springs. For, for people who visited, for example, Yellowstone National Park or other hot spring environments, um, you often see these, these, these colors around the springs. And many of those colors come from pigments in, uh, the, back, in the organisms, archaea and bacteria in these hot springs. Um, and that's exactly where um, we're still finding some of these high temperature organisms and actually where a lot of the molecular biology revolution got its start, you know, from an organism discovered in, in, a, hot in, in a hot spring in Yellowstone National Park. Um, sampling this, these near surface environments like hot springs in Yellowstone or the shallow vents that I showed um, in, in Papua New Guinea um, is relatively straightforward. Um, some of the difficulty then becomes bringing them back to the laboratory. Do you keep them at the temperature at which they were, they were sampled? You know, do the organisms actually survive being cooled down and then being brought back um, up to higher temperatures? So it is definitely a, 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 a transport and laboratory study uh, complexity. I think one of the reasons why people have largely, you know, focused on growing microbes on plates and growing things that, that consume um, oxygen. It is much more difficult, um, but they, we now have to figure out ways to do it. So for example, in high temperature, instead of growing them on plates, um, we'll grow them in high temperature water baths or in ovens in sealed containers and so on. It's difficult, but, but manageable. What, what's amazing about that question, uh, Susan, that you asked is that it highlights both the challenge and the opportunity that's available, sort of the untapped potential of microbes that we have not discovered yet. So Jan is right, the challenge is real. You, you know, we've, we've traditionally focused on growing microbes like E. coli that can work, that can grow quickly and easily in the lab. And some of these microbes that we work with, Jan in particular, can be very difficult to grow. But at the same time, the way I like to present this to my own students and the way that I'd like to frame it to the audience here, Think of all these advances that came from microbes, and they came mostly from the ones that we have traditionally been able to grow very, very quickly, the easy ones, if you will. So imagine sort of what is there to be discovered by focusing on other microbes that are much, much harder uh, to work with. I'm struck by a number I once read. Um, I, I think some people know this, so a lot of the antibiotics that we use to treat bacteria, for example, actually come from bacteria, from, uh, come from other bacteria. And I'm struck by a figure I once read that said that in the golden age of uh, the development of antibiotics, which was the olden days, it's no longer this way, 60s, 70s, apparently 75 or 80% of all these antibiotics came from like one individual organism, one individual type <laughs> of bacteria, one individual type of soil bacteria. And I would say not just in the medical field, but for all these other applications that we're talking about, uh, reducing CO2, making fuels, uh, treating waste, maybe even coming up with new molecular biology tools like the one that you use in your lab, Susan. It's amazing perhaps how much we don't know simply because we've looked uh, 
where the we've looked for our keys where the light is shining. Exactly, we're looking under the light, and yeah, I think it's I, uh, it's nice to remember that, of course, uh, as Mo's referring to me uh, methods such as PCR, which has become such a standard in the laboratory, but of course only worked because someone isolated. Um, a bacterium that liked to live at a very high temperature, and that meant that its uh, its uh, uh, enzymes for DNA synthesis could uh, survive at high temperature, and that that kind of revolutionized what we could do in a laboratory. Uh, my experience as a molecular biologist before and after PCR is really quite dramatically different. And, yeah, and if somebody hadn't been looking, we would never have found it. And then when, when I started thinking about high temperature life, and that's sort of what got me into uh, into microbiology from from geochemistry. Um, thinking that maybe there are some organisms that are able to sort of survive at higher temperatures and it must be really difficult, but they figure out a way. And then sort of it was, a, it was a mind shift that's like, no, that this is actually the ideal temperature for these organisms. Our temperature here at 25 Celsius or even our body temperature at 37 Celsius is far too cold for some of these organisms. They're organisms where the minimum temperature might be 50 or 60 degrees Celsius, right? Where the optimum is 80 degrees Celsius, right? So it's it's not that this is, you know, sort of um, our sort of near surface environment conditions and some of them are able to extend it to go slightly hotter. No, no, for them, you know, close to boiling is the sweet spot. <laughs> or for some organisms living at the bottom of the ocean, you know, with 10,000 meters of water pressure, um, right? Um, a thousand times the atmospheric pressure that we feel, that's where they really want to be. You take them to a lower pressure environment, and that's, 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 that's extreme for those organisms. There are organisms that ideally grow at a pH of one or two, right? Um, not at a pH of neutrality or slightly alkaline, slightly acidic, like most of the life we think of in the oceans are in that surface, but where pH two is the ideal. And when it gets much higher than that, that's extreme. So it's just shifting the idea of, of what, is, what is extreme. Um, that's sort of our, our perception. So I uh, remember, and of course this relates to our colleagues uh, in the marine um, biology section, um, uh, that there have been some efforts screening uh, DNA fragments in the ocean um, for bacterial viruses known as bacteriophages. Um, admission, um, as an undergraduate, I worked on bacteriophage. It was just a phage I went through. <laughs> um, but it's fascinating to me that people are finding these DNA fragments of organisms of, of bacterial viruses where they have, they've never seen that virus before. They have no idea what the host is, which tells us that even in the ocean right off of our own coast, there's an immense amount of uh, microbial diversity that we still haven't begun to plumb. And, um, and it's interesting, both because of the diversity that we have not yet discovered, but also because there's solutions right there potentially as well, right? So earlier when we were talking about uh, this antibiotic resistance crisis, well, it turns out that studying those phages that attack bacteria is just another way of being able to treat infections, right? So instead of traditional antibiotics, you focus on specific phages that these bacteria have learned to live with or attack and fight and be and be infected by. It's just another example where, where without knowing more and more about the diversity of not just the bacteria, but the entire ecosystem that they inhabit and their interactions with viruses and other organisms could sort of open our eyes to things that we weren't even expecting and solutions that we have not thought about before. And of course, we've all heard at this point about CRISPR, a mechanism that um, has been deployed to try to edit uh, uh, genetic changes in humans, but CRISPR, of course, derived from a bacterial system, which is a simple immunity system that bacteria use to try to defend themselves against infecting viruses. And um, a, a plug here for people who just have the, uh, the perfect uh, uh, curiosity-driven research to try to figure out why these bacteria uh, had these repetitive sequences, and it turns out that it's a, a primitive form of immune memory. And it ultimately uh, became uh, 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 derived to become a tool that is immensely useful in the laboratory. It, it has been very interesting looking at the evolution of CRISPR as this amazing uh, genome editing tool. And frequently, you're right, Susan, frequently the story gets told with discoveries that happened on the time scale of about the 10 or 15 last, 10 or 15 years where people started using that for genome editing. But you're right that it's actually more of a 35 to 40 year journey basically, that started with asking some basic questions that had nothing to do with medical applications or genome editing, just about this interesting property of bacteria, this interesting immune system of bacteria. 
20, 30 years worth of basic science, and then some ingenuity of somebody realizing that that can be used for our own purposes for genome editing and, and therapeutics. And then we're at the, then we find ourselves in a multi-billion dollar industry. And I think another example of this uh, kind of the basic stuff is uh, years ago when uh, Richard Kaludner then at Harvard uh, decided that he would study how bacteria respond to uh, uh, DNA damage. Now, if you had been a funding body and somebody said, I want to study how bacteria respond to DNA damage and, and uh, repair damaged DNA, would you have had the foresight to fund it? Uh, you know, fast forward 30 years and the first uh, gene for uh, familial colon cancer identified um, by Bert Vogelstein turned out to be um, an ortholog of the genes that Kaludner had found in bacteria. Um, and thanks to the fact Kaludner had done all this work of this fundamental process of repairing DNA, we now had this amazing insight. Whereas without that work, uh, Vogelstein would have said, what's this gene do? So uh, a big plug here for people who just ask curiosity-driven questions about how things work. And, and getting back to your point about sort of viruses and, and microbial diversity and so on, um, you know, the, the numbers have huge error bars on them, but we don't really have a sense of how many microbial species, if you want to call them that, it's a little bit difficult to define, are out there. Um, you know, we, we keep going to new environments and we pull out you know, samples and we do sequencing of DNA and we find a whole bunch of new organisms every time. And, you know, the tree that I showed earlier, it keeps growing and growing and growing with new species, new um, phyla, new, you know, I mean, really, we'd have very little uh, understanding of how many out, are out there. Um, so, you know, you go to a new environment, you keep discovering new organisms. Um, and most environments are way, way, way understudied, right? We've spent most of our time studying sort of um, the human gut, um, some soils, some wastewater treatment environments, the upper parts of the near coastal ocean, and a few other places. But the vast majority of, of natural ecosystems have not really received any, any study. And we've been focusing on the microorganisms, right, the bacteria and the archaea. Uh, in most environments, viral cells outnumber bacterial cells about 10 to 1 or so. Um, so you could imagine just how much diversity in, 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 in viruses is out there that is completely untapped at this point. I do want to remind our listeners um, that we are welcoming questions. We'll, we'll have some time towards the end of this. We'll answer questions. So please uh, use the Q&A at the bottom of your screen to uh, enter some questions uh, for, for our speakers. It's, it's always dangerous to quote real numbers on this because our knowledge keeps expanding. But there are some estimates right now that say, just based basically on looking at DNA sequences and extrapolating from what we already know and from where we've sampled, that there's probably about a trillion species of bacteria <laughs> out just 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 on Earth, and it, it sort of makes you realize when you look at what we've actually studied versus what we think there is, it's not even a thousands of one percent, <laughs> yeah. right, of this amazing biodiversity that's out there. Well, even big organisms such as the species of yeast that I work on, um, new species of that. Um, uh, 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 it's fission yeast, so it's a little odd. Uh, but in the last 15 years, two new species have been identified unexpectedly. So uh, there's a lot out there. Um, and uh, uh, it's uh, it, it's really quite uh, remarkable and exciting to, to consider that. I want to highlight at this point, and I wonder if uh, you both would like to comment on the environment for microbiology here at USC, where we actually have quite a number of microbiologists. Yeah, um, I think one of the exciting things that we sort of alluded to at the very beginning and the fact that, that I'm invited here and Mo is invited here sort of points to this as well, that is that we have um, microbiologists, especially environmental microbiologists, but in microbiologists in general, not just in biology departments. Mo has, is in a physics department primarily, has several colleagues uh, who are also biophysicists in his department. I'm primary appointment in the sciences department. Um, there are microbiologists really spread across campus. So what what's, what attracted me to coming to USC 11 years ago um, was the, you know, the, the, the fact that you have um, the very low barriers between departments and even schools um, in these scientific disciplines. So microbiology is really spread across many, many different places. I think microbiology is definitely an interface science. Right. I mean, just when you think of the just when you think of all the properties, I mean, we've brought up the fact that microbes can interact with different chemistries. Well, obviously, that is not going to be only studied in a biological sciences lab. This chemist, these chemical mechanisms 
require you know a good understanding of biochemistry and biophysics. Um, so Jan is right. I mean, I, I, I am a professor in a physics and astronomy <laughs> department. And just looking at my own department, we have a group of about four or five people that are very microbial, microbially oriented in their research. It's still physics, right? It's still physics. You're still, in our case, tracking the movement of electrons, how an electron goes from point A to point B. That's as basic a physics question as, as it can get, except we're doing in the context of a living cell. And in the process, we learned that not only the physics is different, but because the physics is different, the application space is also much more different. The other thing that I get excited about when I think about the environment at USC, besides the fact that microbiology is spread out in physics, chemistry, biological sciences, earth sciences, is it sort of opens the eyes of our students to the fact that science is not ex can't be easily uh, divided into these boxes that that are this, that have the same label as the labels of the departments, right? I mean, the bacteria certainly don't care, right, about whether whether the field is labeled microbiology or biophysics or biochemistry or geobiology, for example, in Jan's case. And I think the students really respond to that because they're always hungry, sort of, for for interface sciences where they see all their various pieces of their education from their different courses and departments come together. And, and bringing up the student interest, I mean, the, the, when I get um emails from prospective graduate students, I would say half, maybe even more than that, um, mention astrobiology. You know, the idea of really finding out, is there life on another planetary system? Is, is, is Earth unique or are there environments in our solar system, beyond our solar system, that could be habitable, that are habitable, that maybe has life or had life? And if so, is it similar to life on Earth? This is very different. How would we figure this out? Will there be missions? Can I go to Mars? You know, <laughs> um, so the, the, the astrobiology angle, just as a fundamental science question, are we alone, um, is, is of great interest to lots of students and to lots of faculty as well. But um, I certainly see it in the, in the grad student interest um, the, this question of um, is there you know possibility for habitability um, on a planetary system besides Earth? It also well, opens up all sorts ahead. of uh, yeah. It, it opens up all sorts of routes for interactions between people from different disciplines. When Jan and I first started interacting about ten years ago, it was exactly in this context of astrobiology. We were developing. Uh, Kind of an ambitious research program that we were proposing to NASA, which eventually got funded and Jan was the director of, sort of trying to ask this question of if there was life in other places, how would you detect it, especially if it's underneath the surface, especially if it's buried very deep under the surface. And there's a professor of earth sciences, Jan, who's trained in geobiology, comes to me, a professor in physics who's interested in studying biological electron transfer, and it started off with like a simple conversation where he asked me, well, can we use this electric nature of life to basically come up with some detection scheme for whether there is life underground or not? So it took that kind of interaction and the interactions of our own students who come from very, very different disciplines and their interest in bacteria to then a few years later develop kind of new interesting experiments that are targeted at both studying microbes, but also detecting and quantifying their activity in some interesting environments. I want to uh, highlight, and I, uh, 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 our colleague uh, Steve Finkel told me about the story that uh, he was approached by JPL to discuss a practical aspect of, uh, of um, uh, space travel, which is the formation of biofilms uh, in spacecraft. And how do you prevent these, uh, these, these communities of bacteria that become very resistant? Um, how do you prevent them from causing problems? And we actually have a question uh, uh, that we've been asked, but how important have microbial biofilms been to creating new technology and where does that research stand right now? Can we, uh, can we comment about biofilms and bacteria forming communities? Yeah, I'll, I'll, start, I'll start with that because I can mention some of the technologies that I've already talked about earlier and how biofilms are an integral piece of that. So just to kind of get everybody on the same page, when we're talking about biofilms, we're really talking about cells on surfaces. And that surface could be your skin, that surface could be the electrodes in these devices that I was describing to you earlier. So in some cases, maybe it has a bad function if it's interrupting the activity of your body. In other cases, perhaps it could have some good function. So the question was, well, how does that impact technology? So if you think of the particular type of applications I mentioned earlier, 
where we are relying on this electric nature of these organisms and extracting electricity from them after we give them waste to treat uh, or food to eat. Um, in that case, it turns out that process is much, much better if the cells are very close to the electrode. So the vast majority of the activity actually comes from the biofilm rather than from the free swimming cells in, in the solution. So that is one example uh, in wastewater treatment and making of biofuels, production of electricity. As long as you're interacting with the physical object, it turns out that you actually want to maximize the amount of biofilm activity on the surface rather than get rid of it. And the more you can improve that ability to form biofilms, the more power you get out or the more biofuels that you synthesize or you're more effective at, uh, at wastewater uh, treatment. Um, another question that has uh, arisen um, is that a, a request that we talk more about microbes that benefit humans or the environment and how. So I'm just going to lead off that the, uh, an obvious one is the microbiome. Uh, that's the population of organisms that live um, uh, with us, in us, uh, and is actually a, a key component to our health. Um, and indeed, uh, years ago, um, I had a colleague who wanted to study what happened to children who were born prematurely, and how did you make sure that they got populated uh, with a good population of, of bacteria. Uh, the interaction of bacteria uh, in our guts uh, with our metabolism impacts uh, a variety of human uh, issues, including obesity. And one of the questions of our highly uh, uh, antiseptic lives is um, the reduction in diversity of our own microbiome. But I'm gonna ask uh, Jan to talk about um, uh, bacteria that, that positively, naturally impact the environment in a positive way. Um, yeah. So briefly on the on the on the human front, I think we mentioned it earlier already that um, you know the human body has more microbial cells um, than human cells. So yeah, absolutely, the human microbiome, not just in our guts, but the humans, uh, you know, the surface of our teeth, on our skin. Um, you know, we, we humans are mainly microbe. Um, we ha I had a T-shirt made from a research center that said mainly microbe, and it was basically that idea that. Um, humans um, by by number of cells are more microbial cells than than human cells. Um, as far as natural environments um, and uh, organisms doing you know good in in natural systems, um, I briefly touched on the idea that you know that, that there are organisms that are greenhouse gas consuming organisms. Um, um, I mentioned the the arsenic uh, example. Um, certainly, cleaning water supplies. So um, arsenic was just one example, but or microorganisms being able to metabolize toxic metals. And of course, that doesn't mean turning iron into something that's not iron or turning arsenic into something that's not arsenic. But what it means is taking one form of, um, of a contaminant and producing a less toxic form of a contaminant or perhaps a form of a contaminant that is more easily removed from a system in the sense of arsenic, taking something that's um, dissolved in water that's mobile to something that precipitates and can therefore be removed. Um, or in some cases, um, the, the changing the chemistry of an element, be it iron, be it manganese, be it some toxic thing, from a toxic form to a less toxic or, or non-toxic form. So, you know, just to be clear, we're not, we're not doing um, alchemy um, in, the, in this discussion. Um, uh, some other examples that I mentioned in the, in the sulfur cycle. So organisms, you know, working on, um, a consumption of of H2S, right? So that that really smelly um, stuff that 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 is naturally occurring, um, but it's also very very corrosive. So organisms that'll take sulfides and oxidize them to sulfate, um, which is much less harmful. The second most common, um, you know, anion in the oceans, for example. So it, those are just some examples um, of, of organisms taking a um, a problematic form of, of, a, of an element, be it sulfur, be it nitrogen, be it carbon, be it metals, and producing less problematic forms. One thing I always like to think about when we talk about activities of microbes in the environment like this is that the impact is not small. Right? This is not just happening in small locations here and there on small scale because there's a lot of microbes, because they are in all sorts of interesting environments. These are global scale processes. Right, that are really controlling essentially the balance of our environment, the balance of our climate, even in the case of specific gases. One example that I like to think of that I'll just add to the examples that Jan gave um, are microbes that consume methane. 
in the ocean. Um, there's a lot of methane that comes out of the seafloor. It turns out a good 80% of it is consumed right there by some interesting interactions between specific types of archaea that are capable of eating up that methane and how they interact with some bacterial partners. 80% of the methane in the ocean floor is essentially consumed by that particular partnership between one microorganism and another. And if you think about it, with that kind of scale, our whole climate change formula would be very, very different if it wasn't for the activity of these kinds of microbes in the ocean. So this is like big, small, small organisms and huge impact. Huge impact. <laughs> Another example, really briefly, is I mean, our atmosphere, right? Um, we've had different atmospheres throughout Earth history. Um, we did not have oxygen at 21% um, for most of that uh, at that, that time. So the oxygen in our atmosphere now at 21%. Um, and required for all of complex life um, is only as a result of microbial um, evolution to produce oxygen from photosynthesis, all that oxygen building up in the atmosphere over time to now to get to the level where we have it today. But um, you know, three billion years ago, two and a half billion years ago, um, you know, the, the atmosphere was a completely different chemistry and the chemistry of our atmospheres from the earliest days to now is largely as a result of microbial processes. I'm going to uh, I'm going to uh, take another question, and I'm actually going to um, dive into it myself. Um, question is: How concerned should we be about the widespread use of antibacterial products? Are they making us net less naturally resistant to potentially harmful bacteria? I want to start with antibiotics, which are you know obviously the the antibacterial product we know, and antibiotic resistance um, is a huge issue. Um, so of course antibiotics, uh, uh, we think about Fleming and discovering um, his penicillin and the development of, of, of subsequent antibiotics. Um, I suffered a cat bite um, a number of weeks ago when my cat got panicked and um, was very happy to have amoxicillin as I started to mount a rather large infection on that. Um, but yes, it is an issue. Uh, antibiotics have been used in uh, agriculture because just uh, 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 treating animals, uh, food animals with antibiotics leads to increased size. Um, but of course, microbes are extremely good at one thing and that's growing. Um, and anytime we impose what we geneticists refer to as a selective pressure on an organism, um, the survive, there's going to be a strong pressure for that organism to undergo genetic changes that allow it to survive. Uh, microbes have become extremely adept at passing genes back and forth, even across different species. And so what we see is that the more we treat with antibiotics when we don't need them, the more likely it is that we see a spread of the ability of uh, bacteria to be resistant to those antibiotics, which means that when we need them, uh, they're no longer available. Um, uh, the exact numbers escape me, but a number of years ago, a study was done comparing the frequency of antibiotic resistance in a particular um, pathogenic bacteria in the United States, where antibiotic usage is more limited, um, to a country, uh, I believe it was Venezuela, where you can buy them over the counter. And it was just um, uh, eye-popping. Of course, as we've seen with viruses, uh, bacteria don't stay in one place. They travel around a globe with us. And so uh, antibiotic resistance and antibacterial resistance uh, has become a real issue. So um, if you get a head cold, it's very unlikely that you need antibiotics. Um, and um, uh, yet many people will still ask their doctor for antibiotics that will not treat a viral infection. So it is, a, uh, it is quite a substantial problem. And if we could uh, reduce its uh, antibiotic usage in non-essential places, particularly in agriculture, uh, that would be to our uh, mutual benefit. I Any mean, the rise, yeah, the rise of antibiotic resistance is definitely, obviously, one one huge impact of this overuse of antibiotics. Another thing that I think people should think about is the fact that if we just think of our own human microbiome ecosystem. Given what we were talking about earlier, that you know you might only have very few pathogens or very few bugs in this entire ecosystem that are capable of causing a disease, what happens with overuse of antibiotics is that you throw the whole system out of balance, right? So it is possible essentially to take all you're throwing away the good with the bad, right? Yeah. When you're using when you're using the, all these antibiotic products, you're also getting rid perhaps of all the good microbes that are maybe training your immune system, right? In order to be in order to be able to react to infections in the future, and I think there's a lot of good studies about this so far that are linking early use of antibiotics in infants, for example, to more risk factors downstream. So it's not just the antibiotic resistance, but also adverse outcomes directly for human health as a result of disrupting the 
the resident good microbes, quote unquote. Um, so, Mo, I got another question. This one's really uh, to you. It came quite early. Uh, a question, if the mitochondrion makes energy, is it impacted by COVID since people with COVID uh, and long COVID lack energy? I actually did see a study a few months ago uh, that pointed out that uh, uh, COVID does seem to have an impact on mitochondrial function. And that in some cases where people might have a predisposition to, to decrease mitochondrial activity, that that then gets exacerbated in, in the course of a COVID infection. Now, what is not clear to me, uh, and perhaps because I'm not really a, an expert on, on that side, what is not clear to me is whether there's a very specific angle that ties the coronavirus to the mitochondrion, or is it simply the fact that as we've seen in the last two years, uh, the attack of the coronavirus in the body seems to be systemic. It just affects so many parts of the body, and mitochondria happens to be one of them. But strictly speaking, yes, there's been some studies linking uh, COVID infections to decreased mitochondrial function, especially if there was already some predisposition to decreased activity. And perhaps that could explain the, the general kind of low energy that a lot of people have reported, especially for long COVID uh, symptoms. Very good. So a little foray into some virology there. Um, any, uh, let's see, I don't know if we have any other other questions that have come up uh, yet. So um, maybe we can, we have a, just a couple of minutes left. Perhaps we can have kind of a little closing statement from each of you. I'll, I'll start. I'll start. I'm a person, you know, with training in, in the world of physics and, uh, and biophysics. And to me, it's been really eye-opening to be able to expand the work that we do in our lab to all these interesting directions that are not just asking basic questions, but then expecting some solutions for big problems from these basic questions. And I, for one, you know, we spend all of our time talking about pathogenic microbes, but I, for one, feel very grateful <laughs> for microbes. All, you know, we've already talked about many possible applications for that. Uh, for use of good microbes, if you will. So I feel grateful for them. And I also feel grateful for the interactions they facilitated for me as a physicist when I interact with colleagues that come from that come from other fields. So, you know, my work with Jan started because of our shared interest in microbiology and led us down a path of, uh, of you know, coming up with new technologies for life detection deep underground and also some interesting, some interesting applications. So science is about finding new problems looking for new solutions, and also developing relationships between scientists, which we, which I've had the luck of seeing a lot of, of that at USC. Okay, and Jan. Yeah, maybe, and maybe I'll just end with sort of where we started. I mean, when we, when we had the title of germs, and I think for most people, this goes to um, the, um, the interaction of, of bacteria, with, with humans and specifically human health and the negative effects of, 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 of microbes, right, on the pathogens. And just really getting that point across that, yes, those are incredibly important things to study, absolutely, but there's so much more to the microbial world. And that's where, where that's the sandbox that I play in. And I think it's just so exciting to think about the fact that we've hardly discovered any of the organ microorganisms on this planet. Every environment we go to, um, you know, you take a, you take a, you know, a little cup of seawater um, and most of the organisms in that cup of seawater right outside, you know, off the coast here of LA, you know, will find new organisms um, that nobody's ever seen before and then nobody knows what they're doing. So just the incredible amount of unknown um, as far as um, genetic diversity, metabolic diversity um, in the microbial world, it's just fascinating. It's going um, to, that, that's, that, that's, the part that I want to get across is not just pathogens and, and disease. Um, there's a, so much more to microbiology than that. Well, I would like to thank our speakers, uh, our panelists, I should say, uh, for this really uh, interesting and entertaining exploration of, of the diversity of the marvelous microbes. I would like to thank our audience for joining us uh, for this edition of the Dornsife Dialogues.